Welcome to Wives 101. This is Discipleship for Wives and I am so thrilled to be able to spend this time with you and just share what's on my heart. Marriage is such an incredibly precious subject, especially I think for followers of Jesus. The Bible has changed my life uh, in every way. And when I think about my marriage, where would I be without the wisdom of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of other women in my life? I have no idea, um, but things would not be the way that they are right now, which is good. Things are good. Uh, Nick and I have been married for 30 years, nearly 31 years, and there have been some really, really challenging spots in our marriage, and there have been some super important lessons that we've learned along the way. And really, I guess all I want to do is share with you some of the key things that I've been learning over the last 30 years, the last three decades. <laughs> so I hope you're up for the challenge. Um, this is just evolving as we go along. So let me tell you what, what you're going to need and also what the various um, themes are or topics are that we're going to be looking at together over the next maybe eight sessions. Um, so you're going to need, first of all, you're going to need a Bible. So find your Bible, bring it with you. You're going to need a journal or paper, something to write on. You'll need a pen. You will need, and these last two things are also really important, you will need a teachable spirit. Now, there are going to be things that are going to challenge you. They're perhaps going to be counter what you have heard before, um, but they're going to be straight out of the Word of God, and so you need a spirit that is teachable. <laughs> come ready to learn, come willing to change and grow. And the final thing that is also super important is you're going to need an accountability partner. So you may not have anybody come to mind immediately. I don't know, maybe you do. But have a bit of a think about another woman who is a follower of Jesus who would want you to grow in your marriage. And other than that, really, it can, it can be anyone who fits that description. A woman, a follower of Jesus, wants you to grow in your marriage. She's for you, okay? So a Bible, a journal, a pen, a teachable spirit, and an accountability partner. You don't need to have her here with you, but you do need to have her in your life, and you're going to be going to her between uh, sessions, between times. So if you need to whip away right now, push pause, and go and get the bits and pieces that I've suggested, I'll give you a moment. Okay, so over these eight times together, here's what we're going to look at. First of all, number one, being his friend. That's today. Number two, the mystery of oneness. Number three, how to enact the three-strand chord. Number four, what respect really means to your husband. Number five, words that shape the future. Number six, thoughts and feelings, installing new software. Number seven, Putting first things first and starting at the end. And number eight, the secret power of prayer. So that's eight sessions and let's get into session one. So today we're talking about being his friend. Do you think of yourself as your husband's friend? Titus is a beautiful little book. If you've not read it, it is in the New Testament. It comes after 2 Timothy and before Hebrews. It's a short book, so if you haven't read it before, maybe this could be um, a book that you go to for your devotional um, readings in the next wee while. But Titus is, um, is a book that is written by Paul, the apostle, and he writes it to um, a pastor called Titus, who's a younger man, and he's leading a church in Crete, in Greece, in um, AD 1, first century. And so this is what Paul says, and I'm just going to pick out a couple of verses that relate uh, to what we're talking about today. So Paul is telling Titus what he needs to teach people in his church, and he says, teach the older women, Titus, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, 
to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Okay, really, really interesting. Paul is saying that the older women, first of all, need to take responsibility for their own lives. They need to have their own lives in order. And that's a challenge to all of us, because all of us are older women to somebody. It's a challenge to us that we need to um, have our own lives in order. We need to make sure that we have a reverent way of life, that we're not slanderers. In other words, we don't say horrible things about other people. Um, we're not addicted to alcohol. We don't drink too much. That we're able to teach what is good. And so every single older woman needs this, needs this to be true of her life. So right now I'm being the older woman. Now I have women who are older than me, but I have women who are younger than me. So right now I'm being the older woman. And what the older women are to do, other than have their own lives in order, is they are to teach, they are to train, encourage, exhort earnestly. They are to urge the younger women into good things, the good things of God. They are to urge, that means to cause the young women to come back to their senses, to come back to, or come maybe to for the first time, the good, wise passions of life that are God's for us as women. So older women are to urge these younger women, come on girls, we can do it, that kind of idea. Come on, there's a better way. Let go of that pattern. Come to the fresh new pattern of God. Come to this way of life that is freeing and full and abundant and, and all of the goodness of God for you. And in this particular situation, in your marriage as a wife. Specifically, the how-tos of life that the older women were to urge the younger women into, related to loving their husbands, loving their children if they had them, having a healthy, godly inner world, and being a homemaker. And some of those things, we're going we're to cover all of those things really, apart from the children one, that must be for a parenting, a parenting series later on, but we're going to cover all of those throughout the eight sessions. So today let's focus on loving your husbands, the first of that list of what the older women would urge the younger women into. Interesting, when you have a look at the verse, there's, there's a bunch of different words for love in the Bible. There's four different words for love that the New Testament uses. And the one that this verse uses might surprise you. I wonder when you think about the words for love, if you know them, I wonder which one you might assume that is being used here by Paul as he tells Titus to teach the old, to older women to, to teach the younger women to love their husbands. The word love that is used is actually the word philandros, philandros. So in other words, you are to philandros your husband. And philandros means friend. You're to be a friend. You're to be friendly with. You're to be a companion. It includes the ideas of fondness and affection toward the other person. This is the kind of love that older women were to urge the younger women to grab a hold of and make part of the DNA of them as a wife. This friendship love, this companion, this side by side, this doing life together kind of love. Now it's fascinating when you think of the context in which this was written, the context in which these older women were being told to teach these younger women. So remember, this is the first century AD, this is in, in Greece, and then of course it went out from there into the known world and then continued on throughout the, the generations right through to us today. But, but back then, the women, the women who were married, in marriages, servant love was expected or unconditional love, agape love, was expected. Sexual love was demanded, and empathetic love was hoped for. Those are the other types of love. But filial love, friendship love, that was a whole new idea in marriage. That was rare indeed. It was rare to find a husband and wife who had this friendship love. It was rare to find a woman who saw herself as a wife, saw herself as the friend, the companion of her husband. 
Women didn't have such an expectation of themselves. This was revolutionary for women. This was revolutionary for marriages, that, that the husband would be the friend. Husband and friend, they were not, they didn't go together in the same sentence for women in this day, on the whole. You see, agape love is the love that we usually think of when we think about the Bible and love. Agape love is God's love. It's unconditional, servant-hearted, beautiful, amazing love. It's the 1 Corinthians chapter 13 kind of love, and it is remarkable. It is the love that God demonstrated to us when he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for us on the cross. It's amazing, agape love. But for these women... Agape love was what, it wasn't in question, of course they were to agape, they were believers of Jesus Christ. Every believer in Jesus Christ was to agape, well they were to agape all other people. This was the love of God that God had poured out into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And this just, this was an expectation, you don't choose agape love as a believer of Christ. This is not a choice, this is demanded of us by God. But friendship, on the other hand, is a choice. We choose our friends. We don't have to be friends with everybody. We have to agape them, but we don't have to filia them. And so the older women are to say to the younger women, choose friendship. Choose to be a friend, the friend of your husband. Now, why was it important that this change be made in Christian marriages, that this distinctive be part of Christian marriage in the first century? And now, why is it important now? I'll tell you why it's important. Because the true wonder of marriage had been lost through the generations. God's original intent had, had really been lost through the generations of culture. Filial love goes right back to Genesis, way back to the very beginning, to Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman, the first marriage, the first people. Filial love goes all the way back to Genesis. It addresses the human problem of alone. When God created Adam and he said it's not good that the man be alone. Alone means having no one else. It means separate, it means part, but not complete. It's alone. And God said, that's not good. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that Eve was then created to be Adam's suitable helper. Have you ever looked into what those words mean? The word helper is a wonderful word. It's the word ezer, E-Z-E-R in Hebrew. And what it means is provide assistance and support in times of hardship or distress. Doesn't that sound like a friend? Isn't a friend someone who is there? Isn't a friend someone who comes alongside? Who provides some form of assistance, some form of support when times are tough and things are hard or you are distressed. That's friendship right there. God created Eve to be the ezer, the helper, the one who does that. What a strong, what a beautiful, what a vulnerable, what an important word. A helper suitable for Adam. When you look up the word suitable, it's really fascinating. It means, there's a bunch of things that it means. It means the opposite part or the counterpart. It can mean in front of, it can mean parallel. In other words, this idea of suitable, why was Eve suitable for Adam? Because it encompasses both the idea of being different, they were different from each other. He was male, she was female. We all know that that's different. Um, we also can understand that personality-wise they were different, the way that they thought would be different, the way they feel different. They're different people. So, it, so the idea, it encompasses different, but it also encompasses the word same. So it encompasses different and same. Same meaning that they're both human. In essence, they are the same. They are of the same type. They are both human. They are the same essence. 
And so there's equality and compatibility. There's distinctly different and there's innately the same. And these two things made Eve absolutely suitable as the helper, the one who provides assistance and support in times of hardship or distress, to provide filia love to Adam, to come alongside him so he's no longer alone. Friend. So right now, as an older woman, I strongly urge you to be that friend to your husband. I believe that every husband craves such a friend. Pause for a moment in your journal or on your paper with your pen. Would you write down, please, the top eight qualities of a friend that come to mind? Secondly, think of a friend that you treasure. What makes her such a valuable friend? Write down what comes to mind. I may not have given you quite enough time for that, so you can finish it off later, but I want us to think for a moment about friendship. Friendship is a really interesting subject for women. Quite often for men, and this is, this is not the case for all men, but for a lot of men, they don't really need a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of friends. For some men, their wife is pretty much the only friend that they really feel the need for. For a lot of men, the friends they have are the husbands and boyfriends of your friends. We're different like that. I think for women, we, we go seeking friendship probably a lot more than most men do. But you've probably heard it said that to make a friend, you have to be a friend. If you're a mum and you've had a child come home from school crying because they don't have friends, you may well have said that to your child. To make a friend, you have to be a friend. It sounds simple, doesn't it? And yet it's true for us as well, isn't it? Friendship is a complicated subject. And again, that's a whole nother set of devotionals, isn't it? And discipleship. The area of women friendships. How they evolve over time. What friendship really is. And all the rest of it. You know, sometimes I think that we don't treat our husbands as treasured lifelong friends. And I wonder if you treated your other friends the way you treat your husband, well, would you have any friends left? It's time to stop thinking about what you need from your husband and begin thinking about being his friend. Flip it, turn it around. What does it mean to be his companion, the one who helps him in all of the things that he finds tough and challenging? How's your friendship with your husband? Do you filia, do you friendship your husband? Some of us as women have such high expectations of friendship, we really do. We have such high expectations of friendship. We have huge demands that we hold in our hearts and we feel let down by our friends because they don't meet these demands. And often we turn that a little bit and we say that it's because we are such great friends to other people and that therefore, you know, we expect these things back from, from them. But that's just pride. That really is just pride. And sometimes we actually just need to let go of our expectations on others and start focusing on me as the friend. How can I be the friend? And definitely with our husbands, we need to do that. Could it be that some of us are missing the very friendship that has the potential to be the most significant friendship of our lives? The friendship with our husband. I didn't say it would be an easy one, by the way. 
but the most significant friendship. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 24 says this, There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that wonderful? I wonder what change we would see if we began to be that friend. I wonder what change we would see if we took, if you took the eight qualities that you've listed down as being the top qualities of friendship and you began to be those things to your husband over the next while. I wonder what you'd see. Well, next time we gather together, we're going to look at the idea of oneness. What is oneness? How is it that you nurture and grow oneness in your marriage? So we'll get to that next time. But between now and then, there's a little bit of homework. Three things for your homework. The first one is, ask the Lord, what do I need to learn about being my husband's friend? Jot that down. That's a prayer. Ask the Lord what you need to learn about being your husband's friend. And don't just ask God once, ask him often. The second piece of homework, this might be a little scarier. Ask your husband what he appreciates and what he needs from your friendship with him. Ask your husband what he appreciates about the friendship you have with him and what he needs from your friendship with him. And the third thing, find one other woman that you can be accountable with. Share these things that you're learning with her and ask her to ask you every week how that's going. You might want to share with her the actual homework points that I've just shared with you. This is not a person to moan to. This is not a person um, to go to and say horrible things about your husband. This is the person to go to who you say, look, I want to I'm learning about philia. I'm learning about friendship, love with my husband. I'm going to ask him these questions. I've asked him these questions. Here's what he said. This is what I'm doing about it. This is what God's teaching me. This is what I'm doing about it. And as the accountability person, she needs to hold you to that and really check, how's that going? So maybe you could be that person for someone else as well. I hope this has been helpful to you and I'm looking forward to us sharing next time on oneness. Uh, let me pray for you before I go. Dear Lord Jesus, friend of sinners, what a friend, what a friend we have in you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for friendship. We thank you that we are the friends of God because of you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have designed us to be friends. We thank you that marriage is about friendship. And we ask that you would teach us to be our husband's friends. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye.